A woman shot in the head this morning while driving. What police are saying might help them find out who did it. And a frontal boundary heads our way by midweek. It does bring some changes to the forecast. We'll explain what that means coming up. Live from KSAT 12, the news at noon starts right now. Surveillance video could hold the clues that San Antonio police are seeking regarding an overnight shooting. The victim, a woman who was shot in the head while driving down Fredericksburg Road near Gardena Street. As Katrina Weber tells us, police found out about the shooting while investigating a different case. A wrecked car in the 3500 block of Fredericksburg Road is what drew San Antonio police there around 3.30 in the morning. The situation they found inside of it kept them there for hours. Paramedics realized the driver had a bullet hole in the back of her head. Police found a shell casing down the street. They say the bullet shattered her window, then went through her headrest before hitting the 29-year-old. She was in critical condition as she left to her hospital. Inside that wrecked car, police say they also found out that the driver was on the phone with someone at the time of the shooting. Police say the man at the other end of the call told them he heard a passenger in the car with the woman telling her to speed up. Then he says he heard a gunshot and suddenly everything went silent. Police believe they also heard from the driver just before she was shot that she had called 911 saying someone was chasing her. They say the passenger who already was gone when they arrived is a potential witness and may know who shot her. Investigators also are counting on surveillance video to help them solve this case. Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. The fallout continues after the police shooting of an unarmed teenager in San Antonio, all caught on body cam footage. The family, the family of the teen says he is fighting for his life and a friend of the teen is now speaking out. Officer James Brennan, now a former San Antonio police officer, fired multiple rounds at Eric Canthu's car as he was unarmed at a fast food restaurant parking lot. Now, according to police, Brennan had responded to an unrelated disturbance at the restaurant when he saw Canthu inside the car which the officer says he had evaded him a day earlier. A friend of Ganthu's now speaking out about the shooting. He didn't deserve this. That's he had no reason to shoot at him that many times. It's it's heartbreaking. It's very hard to think about the fear he had in him when it happened. And, you know, the state and condition he's in right now is just it. It breaks all of our hearts. He had no weapon. He had a burger in his hand, you know. Well, so far, there is no update in which Brennan will be charged. As for Ganthu, all charges have been dropped against him. After five years, a woman is set to go on trial today for the murder of her four-year-old daughter. In 2017, Jessica Briones took her daughter to a police substation, bruised and unresponsive. She told police that her four-year-old, Olivia, was throwing up and wouldn't wake up. The little girl died a day later. At the time, Briona said her daughter would fall a lot and hit her head on the floor days before she took her to the substation. But investigators found several other injuries that Briones did not give an explanation for. If found guilty of murder, Briones would face up to life in prison. Opening statements are scheduled to begin this afternoon at 1.30, and you can watch it live on KSAT.com. Well, funeral services are set for later today for longtime Bear County Judge Karen Crouch. She passed away last week from injuries in a car crash that happened back in 2011. Her sister-in-law died in the head-on collision caused by a teen driver in Vermont. Crouch was on the bench for two decades before retiring in 2018 to focus on her family and her health. Funeral services will be held at San Pedro Presbyterian on San Pedro Avenue. A viewing will be held from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. and a worship service starts at 7 tonight. This evening, the Uvalde School Board set to meet for the first time after the fallout from hiring a former DPS officer who responded to Robb Elementary back on May 24th. Since then, the entire district police department has been suspended. And in an email sent Friday, Uvalde Superintendent Dr. Hal Harrell wrote about his 31 years in education, telling staff members he wanted them to be the first to know, quote, there will be an item in closed session to consider and discuss superintendent retirement options and transition, end quote. Families of the victims say they didn't ask for this, but instead have made it clear for Harrell to suspend the district officers who were there that day. The Valley School Board meeting will happen in the Benson Room at 6 o'clock this evening. Our team will be there at both events, bringing you live updates on air and online on KSAT.com. The Volunteer Fire Department in Uvalde is raising money for 15 families. The president of the fire department says he and the firefighters 
wanted to make sure the families of the injured in Uvalde massacre were also taken care of. The fire department was able to connect with 15 families that were affected, learned about their needs and needs for recovery and began asking for donations. The volunteer fire department was able to raise $4,000 for each family. But after donations from corporations and churches, they say they are able to give about $15,000 to each of those families. San Antonio police and crime stoppers need your help in identifying a suspect in a murder case from 2016. 37 year old Angelo Palindo was murdered on October 16th in 2016 in the 1500 block of North Sabata Street and West Laurel Street. Police say several gunshots were heard and a gray colored vehicle took off shortly after those shots were fired. Palindo's body was found down on the street at an intersection of Sabata Street and Lombrano Street. If you have any information, you're asked to call Crime Stoppers at 210-224-STOP. A group of friends searching for a man who disappeared a month ago say they have found his body. Family and friends believe they found 52-year-old Keith Hammond after recognizing his boots. This all unfolding yesterday near Judson Road and I-35. The Live Oak Police Department considered him a person of interest in connection to the death of a woman found three weeks ago in the same area. However, the medical examiner's office has not yet confirmed the body is Hammond's. Have you registered to vote yet? Tomorrow is the deadline. Any U.S. citizen who is 18 years old by Election Day on November 8th can register. And you can register by mail or in person at the Bear County Elections Office or a variety of other locations. We've got that list available. Just scan the QR code right there on your screen. The road work around San Antonio continues. Traffic Authority Stephen Cavazos has a look at the latest construction closures around town. The road closures are going to continue throughout the month of October, so just know what you can expect before you get out on the roadways uh, because some things could hit, impact your commute time. Let's take a look here at State Highway 16, otherwise known as Bandera Road. Now, this is utility work that will actually begin on Monday, October 10th. It's going to last until Friday, October 14th, according to TxDOT. It is overnight, 9 in the evening at 5 in the morning is when you'll see multiple lane closures in both directions. That'll be from Loop 1604 to Diamond K Trail. Let's now take a jump over 281 the north side of San Antonio. Yep, that work's going to continue as well on Monday, October 10th. Asphalt work 8 in the morning to 3 in the afternoon. A single southbound lane main lane closure is what you can expect from Marshall Road to Wilderness Oak. So just plan for that. And let's take one last look here at Lock Hill Selma Road here in Bear County. Utility work will actually has already been current since Sunday, October 2nd. A part of it will wrap up on Friday, October 14th. It's going to be overnight again. So late night owls, early bird commuters 8 in the evening to 5 in the morning is when you'll see alternating lane closures in both directions right there at the Wurzbach Parkway intersection. Now would be a great time to grab those phones and open your camera app. Scan the QR code by tapping the center of your screen. That will take you directly to our KSAT traffic page and that it has a full list of all the closures that are current throughout the month of October. Hey, the Cowboys pulled off another huge win with a backup quarterback on the road. Highlights coming up in sports. Creativity and color at the San Antonio Public Library Foundation hosting a special event to help the future of literacy in the community. Max Massey gives us an inside look when we come back. The San Antonio Public Library Foundation has a mission to strengthen the library in service to our community. There is a big event coming up and easy ways for you to join in and help out. Max Massey joins us from the foundation's headquarters with more. Yes, the San Antonio Public Library Foundation does so much to strengthen our community, but take a look. This is amazing. All of the art, all of the colors, all of the fun joined here with Amy. So Amy, what is all this for? This is for our sixth annual Katrina Ball. We, um, it's our largest fundraiser every year. The Library Foundation raises money to help the library with extra things that the city budget can't cover, like capital improvements, technology, that sort of thing. This year, the proceeds, a portion of the proceeds from Katrina Ball go to support the LCRC and the Texana collections at the library. Now, for those who don't know, how important is the foundation to not only the current people here in San Antonio, but the future of San Antonio? 
Well, in addition to supporting the library, we also at the foundation have a couple of our own internal programs, and those are both focused on early literacy and really building a group of young people who are going to drag their parents to the library. And so what we want is to build that group of kiddos here in San Antonio who understand the importance of the library system and, and all that information and free access to information can do for you. There's a lot going on here. Now, how is this helping out the foundation, and how can people step up and join the efforts? You can go to our website at saplf.org, and through our events tab, you can still buy tickets, access our silent auction, where all of these alabrije will be available for auction, and help us out that way, or you can just make a donation. All right, Amy, thank you so much. If you guys have any questions, we're going to have all those answers. Just head to ksat.com. Max Massey, KSAT 12 News. That's some creative stuff right there. Very cool. Thank you, Max. All right. We're looking for something creative outside, like maybe create some rain. Yes. Oh, my gosh, Justin, we need the rain so badly. We do. We do. And it, there's no doubt about it. We have, a, we have a couple of opportunities, I think, coming up uh, over the next week and a half or so. Uh, the one that's uh, coming up on Wednesday isn't a great chance, but it is there. We're going to have a frontal boundary coming through. We'll talk all about that coming up. The aquifer is down half a foot today to 630.8. Just shows you how badly we need the rain. And in your pollen count, ragweed is moderate, molds are low. Your forecast, straight ahead. Two magic words, rain and hope. Yes, we really need that rain, Justin. I've been doing so much hand watering. I stopped, I completely stopped watering my grass. I was like, this is hopeless, hopeless cause. I'm kind of in the same boat. I yeah. lost a couple shrubs to it. It's, you know, I, I don't want to give up just yet, but it is, it is getting increasingly hard to keep plants alive with this drought. And uh, we're, we're going to get some gusty winds coming up midweek. And so then I have some concerns about fire dangers and those sort of things. So this, these are all things we have to watch with the situation as it is. There is a little bit of rain on the radar this afternoon. We're seeing some light showers up across the hill country, but nothing that's of great significance. We had a couple showers earlier around Del Rio and Eagle Pass. Now we're starting to see some clouds build in, but none of these contain rain, so it's going to be another dry day here in San Antonio. As we look at the big picture, we narrowly missed out on getting some rain. All that has been out across West Texas where they had flood watches in effect, still do, and there's some heavy rain between Lubbock and San Angelo. There's a look at the flood watch. It includes the Permian Basin down into the Big Bend where they could get some good rain out ahead of this upper level low that's swinging north, but it's just a little too far north to give us any lift or any rain here. So that's unfortunate. And there's the scene outside. We've got partly cloudy skies. 82 degrees at the airport, 82 Stinson, 82 across the board. South southeasterly winds 5 to 10 miles per hour. And where there's more cloud cover out west, you will find the cooler temperatures, 72 Rock Springs, 77 in Del Rio, where there is more sun. Temperatures have been boosted, 85 Gonzales, 84 uh, Pleasant, and 84 New Braunfels, 78 right now at Canyon Lake, and 80 in Holotus. Two points jumped up into the 60s this morning, so we saw them rise into the muggy territory briefly, and now they're starting to fall back down into the 50s. So it's not going to be all that humid today, but there was a little more humidity in the air. And over the next couple of days, you'll see humidity levels rise uh, quite a bit until we uh, get into Wednesday. And then uh, once that front comes through, we'll see things drop off again. 86 degrees at 3 o'clock today, 87, 4 p.m. Partly cloudy skies, 84 degrees at 7 o'clock. Should be a great evening. And we fall into the 70s by 11 midnight. And the dew point trend over the next six days, and this really does tell the story. So dew points in the afternoons will be in the upper 50s tomorrow, 60s on Wednesday. So that's when it gets a little bit muggy, and it will also be hot on Wednesday. And then that front comes through Wednesday night and the Thursday morning. That drops the dew point off into the 40s. And we get some gusty winds. Then that's what I was talking about, the fire concerns. And then the dew points jump back up quite significantly, I might add, by the time we get into Sunday. And that leads to some more rain chances, hopefully some better rain chances as we get into Sunday and early next week. Here's a look at the forecast in the short term. 6 p.m. today, just some partly cloudy skies. We'll get some clouds early tomorrow. Still, we'll watch for a few showers out west. And then uh, partly cloudy tomorrow afternoon. By Wednesday morning, clouds really start to fill in as that humidity surges back in. And then by the afternoon, can't roll out a stray or isolated shower. There's about a 10% chance of rain Wednesday afternoon. And then with the front, there's a small chance. Once that front comes through, though, that drier air starts to move in. We get those gusty winds behind the front. 
Doesn't really cool us down, though. That's the unfortunate part. Uh, looks like temperatures will still be pretty warm on Thursday. Uh, very quickly, let's talk about Tropical Storm Julia. Uh, actually, this is now a tropical depression. It's falling apart, so we'll correct that. But winds are at 35 miles per hour. Remember, this started in the Caribbean. It has worked its way across Central America. It has now reemerged in the Pacific, but kept its name because it kept that circulation. Uh, this is really not much to worry about other than it's going to bring some pretty good rain to parts of Central America here over the next day. It already has, but it'll bring even more. Probably doesn't have a whole lot of an effect on our forecast other than some of the remnants of Julia could bring some moisture to us by the weekend. So here's how it plays out in the seven day forecast. 88 degrees Tuesday, 92 and humid on Wednesday. That's not going to be a very nice day, but that front comes through small chance of rain. A little cooler on Thursday, but much drier. 89, low humidity and windy. 88 Friday, and then over the weekend will be near 90. But there is a small chance of rain on Sunday, and I'm hopeful for some better rain chances early next week, guys. Thank you, Justin. We'd take a remnant of Julia. We don't, a remnant would be good. Just a little one. It's a little rain. Texans able to keep a streak alive, and this is a good streak. The Spurs are also able to keep a streak alive, and this is a bad streak. Mm. Good luck. Football coverage powered by Davis Law Firm. This week, Dallas Cowboy head coach Mike McCarthy set the tone for the test of the, for the rest of the season. He was told the Cowboys were five and a half point underdogs against the Rams yesterday. He is his, was his reaction was, "We're nobody's underdog." Players responded. Players agreed. Third play of the game: Dorrance Armstrong with a trip sack on Rams quarterback Matthew Stafford. Demarcus Lawrence scoop scores, 19-yard touchdown. Confusion on the extra point. New deep snapper Matt Overton fired a little too soon. One of those that could haunt you later. After both teams kick field goals, it's 9-3 Dallas. After one, Rams get the lead. Stafford Cooper Cup coming across the middle. That dude's fast. Outruns the entire Cowboys secondary. 75 yards, LA up 10-9, but the Cowboys respond. Tony Pollard, speaking of fast, right up the middle, breaks a tackle, gets outside. There's another tackle broken and cuts back just before he gets to, and then, yeah. 16-10 Cowboys at the half. Dallas adds a couple of field goals, one in the third, one in the fourth, makes a 12-point Dallas lead. Rams last chance. This would end the way it started. Defense. Mike Parsons comes around the edge for the sack, knocking the ball loose. Sam Williams falls on it for Dallas. Ball game. Cowboys win it. 22-10 on the road. Dallas is now 4-1. and one. So here's what they have next week. They've got the Eagles undefeated, 720, Lincoln Financial Field, and you know those Eagle fans are going to be ready for the Cowboys. Hey, it's been a tough year for the Texans so far, the only winless team in the league until they got to play Jacksonville yesterday. They've won eight straight against the Jaguars. Try to keep that streak alive and get a Lovey Smith, his first win as their head coach. Game tied to six, under five to play, and the Texans turned to rookie running back Damian Pierce, and wow, man, this kid's tough. Gets all the way down inside the 5, 22 yards. So give it to him again. Let him do that one more time. He's punishing those Jaguars. Plowing over and through the finish. Picking up 20 yards. Set to the first and goal. Got that. And then here's the last play of the game. And it's the pick. Yeah, Texans end up getting a win for Levy Smith. They had that last Hail Mary didn't work. So they get it 13 to six. That's what, nine in a row now over Jacksonville? Keep playing those guys every week. Houston's now one, three, and one. We was putting together a drive, but we weren't quite finishing them and punishing them and playing our type of football and all. We got back playing our style of football and all. When we play in our style of football, we usually a great offense. You know, when we get things rolling and um, just that play, that play kind of you no know, surge, everyone up, got our spirits up and um, it led to a touchdown. Big win, obviously. Uh, it was a close game and um, felt like well, we did what we needed to do late in the game in the fourth quarter um, to finish it out and get the win. All right, so they now have a chance to get two in a row. Doesn't happen very often. They're at the Raiders Sunday, October 23rd, 3.05. Allegiant. All right, San Antonio Spurs in action at the 18th Senior Center last night looking for their first win of the preseason against Zion Williamson and the New Orleans Pelicans. First quarter, Spurs' Jeremy Sohan running the break to dish it to Zach Collins for the slam. Spurs down four after one. Doug McDermott off the screen. It's a three. It's 50 to 44. Pelicans at the half. Spurs open the third on an 8-2 run. Trey Jones, the floater. 
That tied the game at 52, but then the Pelicans respond with a 20-3 run. Devontae Graham's three-pointer put New Orleans up by 17. And that is how it ended, 111-97. Spurs lose to the Pelicans. They are now 0-3 in the preseason. They still got a couple more preseason games to go. It is just a preseason. They play the Utah Jazz Tuesday in Utah. And then at the AT&T Center, they host the Oklahoma City Thunder on Thursday at 7 o'clock. Come on, Spurs. All right. Coming up, how a new study shows who could be at risk for dementia. And permanent shelter for homeless veterans, how one project in South Carolina is doing just that. Tensions continue to intensify in Russia's war in Ukraine. Russian President Vladimir Putin confirming that a barrage of strikes across Ukraine early Monday were in response to what he's calling a terrorist act. And the bombing of a crucial bridge to Crimea that Russia relied upon to supply its forces. ABC's Justin Finch has the latest. Across Ukraine, a series of withering missile strikes launched by Russian troops ripping through civilian centers and vital infrastructure during the morning rush hour. This video showing a blast in Ukraine's capital city, Kyiv. In that same city, this playground ravaged. Rescuers searching ruins for survivors as parts of Ukraine are now left without power. Officials in Ukraine say Russia's latest attack has left several dead and dozens injured. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky calling Russian forces terrorists and urging Ukrainians to take shelter as his troops continue their counteroffensive against Russia. Speaking Monday, Russian leader Vladimir Putin confirming the missile strikes were in retaliation for the Saturday bombing of a bridge connecting Russia to the illegally annexed Crimean Peninsula. These before and after satellite images revealing the destruction. Ukraine has not claimed responsibility for that attack. Russia's latest aggression follows Ukraine's successes, retaking territory in the south and east. And President Biden last week cautioning Putin isn't joking when he threatens to use tactical nuclear weapons saying we have not faced the prospect of Armageddon since Kennedy and the Cuban Missile Crisis. The White House pointing out there's no new intelligence suggesting Moscow is planning an imminent nuclear attack. What the president was reflecting was that the stakes are high right now, given what, what's going on on the battlefield in Ukraine and given the very irresponsible and reckless comments made by Vladimir Putin. In his remarks today, President Putin acknowledged he called for those multiple strikes in Ukraine, which also hit several civilian centers, which critics also say could be an admission of war crimes. Justin Finch, ABC News, Washington. At least 25 people are dead and more than 50 have not been found after a landslide in Venezuela. That's according to Venezuela's vice president. Heavy rains triggered the landslide on Sunday in Venezuela's in one of Venezuela's state, more than a thousand officials from the National Risk Management System and police officers are participating in the search and rescue plan. The president declared three days of national mourning starting on Sunday with a tweet he sent out that read, quote, in solidarity with the families affected. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un is guiding missile tests in North Korea. State media KCNA reporting North Korea's tactical nuclear units executed the drills from September 25th to October 9th to send a strong military response warning to enemies and to verify and improve the country's fighting capabilities. KCNA also reporting that Kim Jong-un said they have no need to hold dialogues with the U.S. and South Korea, which he called the enemies, adding that North Korea's recent tests should send an even clearer sign that intensifies regional tensions by involving a great deal of force. Former Mississippi Governor Phil Bryant is facing a subpoena related to Brett Favre. The NFL Hall of NFL Hall, Hall of Famer is caught up in a civil suit over an alleged multi-million dollar welfare fraud scandal. Attorneys for the defendant, Austin Smith, say they want to see communications between the ex governor and athlete. The state is suing Smith for the return of more than $4,025,000. The state is also accusing Farb of pressuring a company in which he was invested in to seek nonprofit money. 
Medical news, you may be concerned as you age about getting dementia. A new study looks into whether your race could increase your chance of developing the disease. With more, here's ABC's Jay O'Brien. Doctors say more than 55 million people around the world are living with dementia. There are many known factors that can increase the risk, and race could be one of them. In the largest study on race and dementia, researchers at the University of California in San Francisco studied nearly 2 million veterans across the U.S. They found higher rates of dementia in Hispanic and black people compared to Native American, Asian, and white people. Rates were 99% higher for Hispanic veterans and as high as 55% for black veterans compared to white veterans. If you or a loved one may be showing signs or symptoms of dementia, health experts recommend making an appointment with a doctor for further evaluation. With this Medical Minute, I'm Jay O'Brien, ABC News. A $3 million effort is underway to provide permanent shelter to homeless veterans. The first phase, a community of 25 tiny homes, is now in its finishing stages in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. It is all thanks to a group called the Veterans Welcome Home and Resource Center. The second phase will add eight duplexes and a resource center equipped with a kitchen and laundry room. Organizers hope to have the veterans moved into their new homes before the winter starts. 83 degrees at 1235. Justin Horn, you have the cutest picture behind you right now. Yes, I will agree <laughs> with that. Uh, this is just an case at Connect. This is out of Kerrville. That is Tootsie. Oh, Tootsie. Yeah. Uh, in, in, yellow bells there around Tootsie on a cool afternoon in Kerrville. Looks pretty nice. I'm assuming uh, Tootsie is enjoying the weather as it is there. Uh, looks very comfortable outside. We appreciate the picture. You know, we got a lot of uh, pictures in of your pets, your animals. We love seeing all these. You can always send them into our KSAC Connect and we'll share them on air. Thank you so much. Here's a look at the weather headlines. We look back and we had a few clouds this morning. It was a great sunrise. Felt great out there. We're watching some of the showers out west. Most of those are starting to die down, but we can see a few more this afternoon. Heat and humidity returns by Wednesday. Wednesday not only will it be humid, but we could be looking at temperatures in the 90s. Here's the good news. We've got a front that moves in by late Wednesday night into early Thursday. That brings lower humidity, windy conditions, and it will feel a lot better by the end of the week, at least with regards to humidity. Right now we're at 82 degrees, dew point is at 57, south southeasterly winds at about 8, and we are seeing winds gust to 17 miles per hour. It could be a bit of a breezy afternoon. Here's your case at 12 hour forecast. 86 degrees at 3 o'clock. We're up around 87 for a high today, 84 by 7 p.m., 80 at 8 p.m. Southeasterly winds 10 to 15 miles per hour. And by tomorrow morning, we're back close to the low 70s, upper 60s. Uh, we'll talk more about this frontal boundary, what it means for the end of the week, and when more rain chances will pop up in our forecast. That's in just a bit, guys. All right, Justin, thank you. Now to an incredible rescue caught on camera in Michigan. It involved what people are calling hero school bus drivers. Bus drivers working together to save a two-year-old after a carjacker drove off with the child inside. ABC's Gio Benitez has a story. This bus driver's day is about to become anything but typical in Kentwood, Michigan. Parents are frantically waving them down. Their car was just stolen and their two-year-old baby is inside. They screamed at me that somebody had stolen their car um, with their baby in. The mother approaches in tears. So immediately I got on the phone to 911. But Dave Skinner didn't stop there. He got on the radio to tell his colleagues, and that made all the difference because another bus driver, Sue Figueroa, was listening. I just saw a little girl, a little baby around the corner standing with a blanket on. She turns that bus around and rushes to help the child. The thieves had left the baby on the side of the road. Come here, baby. I know. I know. Bringing the child onto the bus wrapped in that blanket, making a promise after she puts the child in a seat. Just minutes later, that incredible reunion. Ma'am, is this your baby? He's okay. He's okay. He's okay. He's okay. Cars are replaceable, but I'm glad her child's home. Wow. Incredible. Great story. All right. A song on Beyonce's new album sparking some controversy. What the singer is saying about it. 
And a new report released over fast food drive through lines. We'll tell you which one is the slowest and which is the fastest. Hello, everyone. These are your top headlines from Cheddar News. Electric vehicle maker Rivian conducting a voluntary recall of all their 13,000 vehicles due to a loose fastener. Now the fastener connects the front upper control arm and the steering knuckle. This can cause loose and vibrating tires, wheel tilt, and loss of steering control. Meanwhile, retailers planning to offer a wider assortment of Halloween merchandise this year, and that's expected to lift total Halloween spending to a record $10.6 billion. That's according to the National Retail Federation's annual survey. On average, consumers will plan to spend $100 for candy, decor, cards, and costumes. And the iPhone 14's new crash detection feature, which is supposed to alert authorities when it detects you've been in a car accident, has now had an unexpected side effect. It's been dialing 911 on roller coasters. The Wall Street Journal is reporting that that feature has sent law enforcement to amusement parks on numerous occasions. It is after mistaking a thrill ride's twists and turns for a real emergency. And that's your Cheddar News Update. I'm Baker Machado coming to you from Cheddar Studios in Lower Manhattan. And when it comes to fast food, experts say Taco Bell has the fastest drive through line. And guess who has the slowest? Chick-fil-A. But this is according to a 2022 QSR drive through report. So Chick-fil-A may be the slowest only because it's so popular and there are so many cars in line. While Chick-fil-A customers spent the most time in line, they don't seem to mind giving the chain a 93% satisfaction rating for speed. The second slowest drive through according to the survey, McDonald's. And coming in first place for the fastest drive through went to Taco Bell with an average time of 221 seconds, meaning most customers get their food in well under four minutes. You know when you eat that whole bag of Cheetos and you get all that orange sticky Ugh. stuff all over your fingers? Gross. Well, now that sticky stuff is being immortalized. That's right, by getting a giant 17-foot statue wow. of a hand holding a massive Cheeto. So the Cheetos brand erected the statue in the Cheetle community of Alberta, Canada. Why there? Well, because Cheetle is actually what the Cheetos company calls its infamous cheesy fingertip dusting. The unique art of war, the unique art piece will only be in Cheadle until November 4th. Hey, Twitter has locked Kanye West's account after an anti-Semitic tweet posted by the rapper on Saturday. The rapper, who now goes by Ye, put out an anti-Semitic tweet toward Jewish people. Twitter has since locked the rapper's account for violating its policies on hate speech. On Friday, West's Instagram account was also restricted for policy violations. The Anti-Defamation League has called Kanye West's social media remarks dangerous. Well, Beyonce, known as Queen Bey to her fans, is denying claims she misused a riff from another band's song on her latest album. Beyonce's seventh album, Renaissance, was released in July and samples iconic house and disco artists. One song, Alien Superstar, features a tune similar to the 1991 British pop band Right Said Fred's hit I'm Too Sexy. The band claims she never asked them permission to use the melody. Beyonce's team said not only did they give permission, they also paid to use it. Remember that song? I remember that song. I'm too sexy. Go ahead, David. <laughs> Sing away. That's enough. Let's hear it. <laughs> 83 degrees. I'm too sexy. Uh, Former disc jockey over here. Uh, I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> so yes. About me being a disc jockey it, or singing a song? Both. Uh, no. <laughs> Just kidding, you were, you were great. At 82 <laughs> yeah, degrees so far today, 64 was low this morning. The record is 98, set back in 1894. The record low is 42, set back in 1990. So we can't get chilly this time of year, but we're not seeing numbers like that in the forecast. We do have a front that comes through midweek. We'll tell you what that means for our forecast coming up. We were just talking about how dry it is. I, I think I said last week that uh, the, the water trough has become the, the neighborhood watering hole. And I was also worried about a big grass fire on the way home on 281. And now you're talking about wind and that's not going to help. We need some rain. We really need that rain. In the worst way. And you guys, you know, we were talking about it last half hour. So I thought I'd bring up the numbers and Whoa. we can look at kind Ooh. of the, the deficits. I, yeah, I'm just the messenger here. Uh, <laughs> we're down four inches for the month or since September 1st, I should say. And since January 1st, 
we've picked up 8.2 inches of rain. That is 17 and a half inches below average. This is the driest year to date we've ever seen. Uh, pretty incredible. I mean, that number is so low. And uh, until we get some more rain, yes, I think there is a, a serious fire threat. If we start getting gusty winds and low humidity, uh, it may not end up so well. So uh, rain is really uh, <laughs> what we need so, so badly. And I, I think there's a couple of chances in the forecast, one small one midweek, and then maybe a little better as we get into the latter part of the weekend and early next week. Right now, we've got 82 degrees outside. Dew point is at 57. That number's down a little bit from where it was earlier this morning. South southeasterly winds at about 8 miles per hour. And we look at the satellite picture here, and you can see some of the clouds starting to roll in. So we'll get partly cloudy skies this afternoon. Some of the thicker clouds are out west. We did have a, a couple of rain showers earlier. Those have since dissipated, so not really expecting much rain around the area today. And temperatures at this hour, 82 Rio Medina, 79 Bernie Stage, 81 Bandera, 73 out in Lost Maples, 82 down in Stinson, and you've got 83 right now in Seguin. The big picture here, you'll notice there is some rain up across North Texas, places like Lubbock, over towards Wichita Falls, getting some decent shower activity this morning. And that's a little piece of energy that is rotating around an area of low pressure out over New Mexico. The path of this area of low, of low pressure just moved a little bit too far north to give us any chances down here of seeing showers and storms, which is disappointing. Uh, temperatures today should be up around 87 here in town, 88 New Braunfels, 88 Seguin, 88 Forestville, pretty similar to where we were over the weekend and much of last week. But temperatures will warm a little bit in the coming days. We'll also see a little bit more humidity. So by Wednesday, we've got dew points in the low 60s. These are during the afternoon. And we've also got some temperatures in the 90s. So Wednesday is going to be a hot and humid day. Then our front comes through and we get windy conditions and then some very dry air by Thursday and Friday. And that's where my concern lies. Gusty winds, low humidity. You have to start thinking about uh, the grass fire threat. So when we start getting some of these dry fronts by Saturday and Sunday, dew points jump back up pretty rapidly and hopefully we'll have enough humidity in place Sunday into Monday of next week that rain chances will return to the forecast. So here's a look at one of our computer models by this afternoon just as partly cloudy skies, really any rain staying well off to our west. And then tomorrow morning, still showing a few showers out around Del Rio, perhaps, but mostly cloudy skies here and then partly cloudy during the afternoon. A lot more cloud cover by Wednesday morning. We'll start off overcast and then we'll see some breaks. And by Wednesday afternoon, there could be enough there to get a couple of isolated showers going. I'd say a 10% chance. And then with the front, about a 10% chance, maybe a little better shot if you're south of San Antonio where there's just a little bit better moisture. But gusty winds kick in. And this is Thursday morning, by the way. We'll get gusty winds and you'll feel a little bit of change when it comes to the humidity, not necessarily the temperatures. 89 on Thursday behind the front, but 92 on Wednesday. So there's a little bit of a change there. 88 Friday, and then we're in the 90s Saturday, Sunday. We'll watch for a small chance of rain on Sunday, 89, and hopefully some slightly better chances early next week. Guys. Thank you, Justin. Well, it's a luxury space cruise, but the trip doesn't turn out to be so luxurious after the break, a preview of the new season of Avenue 5 that premieres today. Hilari is back at the helm of a luxurious space cruise that's gone very wrong in a new season of Avenue 5. CNN's Rick Damagella gives us a preview of the new season that debuts on HBO Today. It's going to be eight years till we're back to Earth. If I tell the passengers that we are stuck up here and the food is running out, I'm going to become the next all-you-can-eat buffet. Hugh Laurie keeps calm and carries on in season two of Avenue 5. Is everything okay? Yeah, everything's fine. As ever, you find us uh, trapped on board an errant spacecraft uh, on, on a voyage that was supposed to take uh, a pleasant number of weeks that has now turned into a, uh, an unmeasurable number of years. Burn or starve? Well, it's nice to have options. You know, I think I preferred it when it was chicken or fish. It is mostly, though, about how a large number of people in a contained space can keep from um, tearing each other to pieces. Um, it's a sort of, uh, it's a kind of a grown-up Lord of the Flies um, survival story. If it was a grown-up Lord of the Flies, it would be King of the Flies, wouldn't it? Really? Oh, you see, you know, that <laughs> I was just supplying a first draft, and he's already come in. He's tweaked it. 
<laughs> he's got King of the Flies. Actually, that's not a bad t title for an episode, is it? The twilight of the moron tyrant is upon us. The pandemic delay between seasons didn't cause the series creator concern. Even though we'd had a gap of about two years, it was like we just picked up from our conversations from the previous week, really. It just got going really quickly. It was just there. Once everyone's back together again, it just flowed beautifully, really. It was great fun. Sorry, I'm just internalizing a lot of panic and fear right now. But now I've done that, and I'm back in the room. In Hollywood, I'm Rick Damagella. Hey, if you couldn't get enough Halloween DIY last week on SA Live, they've got a bonus episode for you today. Yeah, let's see what Mike and Fiona are scaring up today at Market Square. Well, it is a bonus day of Halloween DIY projects right here on SA Live. Yes, and we are kicking off the week with several easy things you can make for the spooky season. All right, Stephanie Pena Frost joins us with spooky decor and Halloween decorations that stand the test of time that will last out there in the elements. Yes, indeed. And how about sweets? We're talking cookies and Halloween cookie kits that you can make with the kids. And eerie and festive Rice Krispie treats with a local with local baker sweet teas treats. And it's a Mad Science Monday, and we have spooky glow in the dark fun with things that you already have at home. And that's always the best thing when you go to the cupboard and you go, okay, let me this this, mm -hmm. this, yeah. And, and, and that's the thing, is these are easy, affordable things that you can do. Mm -hmm. Andre Cook always has wonderful ideas, and <laughs> we always like to play when she's here, too. So. <laughs> All that and more when SA Live continues in just a few minutes. Nice voice. Right now we're at 83 degrees on our way to 87 this afternoon. Partly cloudy skies, 88 tomorrow, 92 Wednesday. That's going to be our hottest day. It will also be a little bit humid. Small chance of rain Wednesday night and a Thursday as that front comes through. Lower humidity Thursday, not much cooler, but at least it'll be drier outside, guys. Speaking of dry, dry humor on SA Live today? A little DIY in your Halloween? <laughs> There's always humor on There's SA Live. Humor. And this one could be a spooky show. Ooh, spooky but let's get season. to it. SA Live starts right now. Today on SA Live, we're going to show you how to DIY the decor you see in the stores and how to reinforce some of the decor you buy so it lasts out on your front yard. Pumpkin succulent centerpieces. We'll show you how you can transform any pumpkin into a beautiful decoration for your home or maybe even a gift idea. We are going to help you have a glowing good time in your Halloween party with something that you have in the house right now. That's coming up on SA Live. Celebrate San Antonio. Coming to you live from historic Market Square. This is SA Live. Great hair is good for something, isn't it? <laughs> That's like an episode of Weird Science or something. <laughs> Hello and happy Halloween DIY week. Yes, all week we are helping you save money and get into the spooky spirit. And today is all about the decoration. I like the little yes. dance you're doing right there. <laughs> Good afternoon, I'm Fiona Morris-Tiza. And I'm Mike Ostrich. Well, Halloween is arguably one of the biggest decorating holidays, probably right behind Christmas. Yeah. And so we want to know, <laughs> what are your Halloween decorating tips? And what are some of those decorations that kind of give you a little bit of trouble every year? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the Christmas lights that are always burned out of here, but that's a different season, so. <laughs> but let us know at SA Live KSAT on Facebook and Twitter, and we'll see if we can air a few of those later on in the show. All right, well, like we said earlier today, we are kicking off our Halloween DIY week with decoration. And who better with DIY? All sorts of different things, but Stephanie Pina Frost from the Princess and the Monkey Twists and popular Halloween decorations that you can make with stuff around the house, which is the best thing to do. Exactly. Right now, I mean, there's such a shortage of everything at the stores, and this is a great way to use what you already have if you can't find something. Yes, so we are starting with floating candles, kind of like in Harry Potter, yes, right? Yes, yeah, in Harry Potter, <laughs> I didn't know what this is. Okay, and so the 
those are the ones that you made that we're, we're looking at on, on the screen. Yes. And these are the store-bought ones. Yes. Um, you know, so this is a way to kind of take what you see in the store and DIY it at home. And I do like what you did with it because they're, they're, they've got some width to them. They yeah. do, and you can do different sizes, yeah. different shapes, because candles come in all different shapes and sizes. Mm -hmm. So these were water bottles that I took. You want to look for the flat bottom ones and the flat sided ones. We cut the tops, flipped it upside down, put them in there, hot glued them in there. You don't want to use a super high temp glue because it will melt the plastic. But this way it gives that those tea lights, and they're the pumpkin tea lights, a place to sit in. Then you drill some holes, poke holes in it, run some fishing line through it. And, and to make it look like the wax is dripping down here, she used hot, hot glue, glue for that. Yeah. And you can just you know squeeze some hot glue on there. And of course you, you paint over that. And so I have some, some gold paint, some bronze gold paint. You could kind of yeah. accent it once it's done to kind of give it that really cool little effect to it to make them unique and special. And then you put four holes in it mm -hmm. and just took a little fishing line right here. And this is, boy, this is the real fine stuff. And you said a good way to thread this through is? You can do it on a toothpick. So you okay. could like tie a knot to the end of a toothpick and poke it through those holes. If you find that the holes kind of move once you glue them, you could take a pair of scissors and just cut the little slit a little bit more to kind of fish it out. It's just like threading a needle. Okay. And you put the tea light in here and there's different, there we go, like yes. that. And look at that. And they float. And it's a floating candle. So and then if you need to the change trees. the batteries, you just kind of pop it pop out, it right? Out. It's and not then glued in, not permanent. That's not glued in. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that idea. That's so a great one. So you paint the light to match the candle. Mm -hmm. So say if you don't want to do a floating one, I have a little plastic jar. I put a piece of plastic on it, and you can just put it on. You can paint them black. You can paint them red. You can do any colors and just kind of take it from being a hanging to be on a tabletop. OK. okay. Now, ghosts. And yes. this is a fun one one. It does involve chicken wire. So you want to use gloves and you want to have safety goggles on because if you start cutting this, uh, you know, those little start sharp ends on everywhere. there and everything. Yes. So you've just taken chicken wire and, and formed it up into almost. So we cut it into a triangle and then okay. we kind of, we kind of lace all the pieces together. That'll give you the, the starting shape of these floating ghosts. And then you uh, take the, okay. take the waist, kind of make it to where, kind of okay. bring it down a little bit. And then you just use your fist to make kind of the, the, make bodice, the bodice, if you will. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and then it, the chicken wire, it's easy to mold. It takes a little bit of time and practice, but don't be afraid yeah. because you can always pull it back out and reform it. Right. Okay. Be as simple as you want. And then you spray paint them white or get the glow in the dark spray paint, of course. And then you can take another couple of triangles and sort of put them on almost in an on X an X shape in kind the back. of X. Because this is going to give it the weight it needs to really kind of stand in your yard. And so again, it, watch it with these little ends because they pick on anything and they'll stick to anything, little sharp edges there. Yes, this is something that adults should definitely do. If you want, you can, you know, really clip everything and turn everything under to make okay. it kind of safer for kids. But this is definitely an adult project. Okay, and, and this is the one the, that you made right there. Yes. And then also what's cool too is you can take just some, and this is really, really fine cheesecloth. Yes, I bought it at the craft store. Yeah, I buy it by the yard, I buy it by the bolt. And you can just kind of hang it on there and then it kind of blows in the wind and it looks like mystical creatures, yes, ghostly figures, exactly, yes. floating around. Put some lights underneath that or you could even hang these in trees, which I think would be really cool looking. Right, you can do so, and you can make them as tall and big as, as, I mean, as you like. Look and at that. That thing's great. I love that. <laughs> it's so simple, so easy. Yes. Okay. So, so the, and then this final one, um, these are these are the foot these these are the furniture footing. Uh, bought them again at the hardware store, painted in black, put a little base on it to kind of secure it with some with some wood glue. And then I took some old uh, skeleton heads that I had and I po poked a hole in the bottom of it. And then you just kind of force it down on there. And then you decorate it with any ribbon or flowers, that, extra flowers that you have kind of laying around. It's a good way to kind of reuse uh, reuse different different items around your house. And then just put it on there, and there's your uh, your centerpiece. Oh, look at it. Yes. All right. Tell folks where they can find you. So you can find me either online on social media, or um, I'm doing a class in Bernie this weekend, making some holiday gnomes. It's kind of a fun little thing. And uh, so, yeah, so social media, Instagram, Facebook. And if you like information on how to get there, go to our website, SALive.com, and click on the As Seen on SA Live tab. And Stephanie's going to be coming back with some more great decorating tips and things that you can do at home for Halloween to get all spooky. We love it. Thank you, Stephanie.
Well, if you're looking to add some nice decor to the inside of your home, we have an easy way to add more life to the pumpkin you find. Yes, indeed. If you have succulents around your home and maybe a little bit of moss, you may be able to pull this off with everything that you already have. And here is more from the San Antonio Cactus and Xerophyte Society. I'm Mandy with San Antonio Cactus and Xerophyte Society. We're going to show you how to make succulent topped pumpkins today. The very first thing you can, you'll see we have some little birds and other things you can stick in there if you want. We are crazy plant people, so we have a wide mix. We have members as young as in their teens, um, up to their late 80s. They can find us on our website at sax.org, San Antonio Cactus Zero Fight Society.org, or you can find us on Facebook and Instagram under sax.org, or sax, just look at the SACXS. So aside from these cute little table decorations you can make, um, you can actually have, garden, have a lovely garden with succulents and cactus. Um, we're approaching the fall season, so um, most succulents are not frost hardy. So if you do have your succulents and you're able to bring them in, whether you have a greenhouse, a garage, your kitchen table, um, we, you should bring them in when it gets below, you know, close to freezing. Hold back on the watering. They don't like, you don't need to water them in the winter because they do store their water in their leaves. And so if it freezes, your succulent might is burst. Yeah, you don't have to have a green thumb to garden with succulents. Um, they are great for people because you can literally ignore them and they flourish. Those are so right. pretty. Right. And it looks very easy to do too. I love right. that. Hey, if you'd like uh, more information on the San Antonio Cactus and Zero Fight Society, just head over to SALive.com and click on the Ad Scene on SA Live tab. All right, still ahead on the show. It's all about decorations, even decorating desserts, where you can get Halloween DIY kits with everything you need to make some spooky cookies. Want your Halloween decorations to have that extra creepy edge? We're calling on our mad scientists to help us to create spooktacular displays. It's next on SA Live. Halloween DIY week. Ew, ew.